Hi, welcome back to Ribbon Candy Hooking. This is Deanna. I have to preface this video by promising you I'm not sweating, although it's 190 degrees. Um, I'm fresh out of the shower, so don't be repelled by this video right on the onset. I am just making a quick start to what I think is going to be a great and helpful video. I just posted a video the other day on four different finishes for beginners, finishing the edges of your rug, and I'm going to do one more today with a project that I'm finishing myself. I thought one more simple one cannot hurt anybody. So um, I'm going to be doing that today and we're going to do that together as we go along. So the story behind this pattern and this project, I have to give a huge shout out to Jane Switzer. She won the giveaway wool this month and she asked me to make a um, pattern or to think of a pattern um, that would fit the wool. It was these 12 colors of wool here. I've got them all messed up now. Um, but all nice, solid, bright colors. Um, and this, the, the combination of wool, the package that it was, six by eights, 12 six by eights, could make a pattern that was between 11 by 11 and 12 <clears throat> by 12. Two of the more interesting pieces in the giveaway were um, this one that's like a spotted white, which made the background in the end, and this black. It's like an antique black, but it's got a bit more than black in it. There's splashes of other colors but it still reads as quite dark so um, what I'm doing here is I'm putting together together a pattern that I'll offer on our page and on all my shopping pages and it is this design um, and thank you to Jane because I have never done this before where I had to sort of think about a pattern um, I don't want to say design a pattern because that sounds so pretentious but whack together an idea for a design or a pattern that would be limited to a palette of 12 colors. It's a challenge and I've just never thought along those lines so it was a great challenge. Um, so I did this um, and I think it worked fairly well. It's called Topiary Standoff and there's like a topiary bird here. If you can see that and my lighting's not super great. And then the vase on the table has a bird facing this bird. So it's using these 12 colors and only these 12 colors um, this will be coming as a kit cut into fives, and the kit will also include the wool I used to back this. I'm sorry, to bind this. So that's what we're doing today. And I want to show you, how, oh, I'm starting this project out. It's really similar to the other bindings that we did. I am, if you remember the other bindings, some of them were fold overs, uh, fold behinds where you uh, just, you know, stitched underneath behind. And we did a couple whip stitching ones that were roll uh, techniques like this one is. So what I've done so far is I have literally taken the, the piece itself. I've trimmed it down to about an inch and a half to two inches on the sides. This is probably still a little bit too wide. I'm going to just trim that down a little bit more. Don't want a lot of excess because if you have a lot of excess, this is a small piece. This is about 11 or 12 by 12. So you don't want a lot of excess um, unless you mean to, of course, because it's going to make for a big bump around the edge. Now with this technique, like one of the other ones I showed you in the long video of four finishes, uh, this is going to be a whip stitch with a fairly low finish. And if you saw the other video already, you can probably see where I'm going with this. But what I'm doing at this stage is creating more heat in my workspace with this iron. Fantastic. Um, I'm rolling as I go. I'm just rolling it in to get the sides down, little sausage rolls, right? And, you know, I, I manipulate it. I'm just rolling and pinning as I go. Pinning helps a lot. It's helping it stay secure. Sometimes on these corners, you can see I cut the corner a little bit. I'm going to cut this corner a little bit too. My last video, I cut a little too deep in and ran into trouble, but it's with a whip stitched binding edge um, doesn't make any difference. You're whipping over it anyway. So sometimes I find it easier on these little corners to just fold it in first here. And sometimes, you know, if you're not a sewer, you don't have pins around. So then forget about the pins. This is not essential equipment by any means. But if you want to pin just to keep this in place while you roll your little sausage over here, if you're a pasta maker or a pastry maker, this is going to be second nature to you. I am neither, and I always struggle with this kind of binding, any kind of binding I struggle with. But it's just, um, it's the for me, the part that I like the least, and for a lot of people, a lot of rug hookers and punch needlers, it's the part that you like the least. 
So you figure out which way you like the best and you just get on with it. Like anything in life that you don't like doing, taxes, dentist, so many things. Uh, homeschooling, that one's right at the top of my list. So I'm just rolling, although I think I am going to homeschool again this coming year in 2021 because I'm too scared to let those babies go out into the crazy school where everybody's licking stuff and touching stuff. So I am rolling as I go. And if you're noticing that the corner, see me pressing and pinching and manipulating to make a nice tight little roll there, that's something I'm just doing with my fingers. There's no science there. It's just feel as you go. And if you're noticing that on the corners, it looks a bit skimpy, I'm not worried about that because when I do these corners, when I whip stitch the corners, the yarn itself is going to create so much bulk on those corners. There's so much more yarn on the corners. If you are like a crocheter and you've ever done a granny square, the corners get very heavy with the weight of the textile. I'm adding a lot of material to those corners. So they can be a little bit skimpier. Um, that's why I'm cutting them down because if I left them full, the corner would be bumping out and then when I come around with my whip stitching it would be excessively bumpy. So I'm not going to pin here for those of you that don't do stuff with pins and don't do anything with sewing. Let's forget about pins on this corner and I'm pressing as I go searching for pins and I'm just going to do this all the way around. Now I'm going to project forward to tell you where I'm going with this. Where I'm going with this is I'm going to finish rolling this all the way around and then I'm going to take out the color that I choose for the binding, the edging, and I'm going to take out my needle and without using a cord, without folding anything behind, I am going to be whip stitching over the edge that I'm creating now. I'm going to be whip stitching these little crust, the little pizza crust edges, a hundred different names for them. I bet there'll be a hundred more by the next video but I'm just gonna be whipping around those. So I'm gonna let you go now while I take my daughter to horseback riding and I'm gonna come back and I'm gonna have finished this last edge and I'm gonna be beginning, you're gonna see the beginning of the whipping, yeah. I am back working away on this little piece and this is where we are. Let's do this together real close up so you can see what I'm up to here. That should do it, right? So I've got my thread. I'm using thicker thread than um, one would normally use for sewing, you know, so quilting or whatever. Um, this is just heavyweight. There's there's rug threads. There's heavyweight threads. For this part, really, any thread is fine. Any thread is fine. If it doesn't break, you're good. Um, so there's nothing particular that you really, really need with this. If, if you're standing there in the thread aisle, just get the heavyweight one. Just make life easy for yourself so it doesn't break. Um, but it's not a requirement. Thread is a requirement. I've also got these little chenille needles that I like to use because they tend to have, I'm grabbing, you see there's like two sizes in here. I'm grabbing one of the tall ones. They're, these two are identical. And then I think these three are identical. I'm, I like these little chenille needles, be, <laughs> needles because they're the same size as a regular sewing needle. They're not like super long ones. Um, so easy and, and predictable to use. And they have a giant eye on them, so it's real easy, particularly for me with my changing eyes and failing eyes, um, to thread them and to use, you know, this is a little bit thicker, this heavy, heavy weight um, thread that I'm using goes through real easy and fast, but it's got the larger eye and it's also, and this is the key, sharp. For this part, you know, I am sewing through the edges here, I'm sewing through two layers of monk's cloth in this case so you know i want it to be sharp if it was just a plain tapestry needle it would be dull um and it would be a little bit harder for me to do what i'm trying to do here so sharp is good for this part now i'm going to continue where did i leave off oh my gosh i didn't even start this part so you know what let's keep rolling our little sausage roll our little crust and i'm getting it right up to the border of my loops just pin as I go party you can come as you are party remember those 
when I was younger in the 70s and 80s, we always, always had come as you are parties or the neighbor would call and say, it's come as you are party and you just leave with your bunny slippers and your pajamas or whatever. Of course, nobody ever came looking, you know, lewd or anything. I guess people might do that now. Things are changing. But this is a roll as you go party right here. This is my last pin going in. I stabbed myself, so that's just the way last pins are. So now I'm going to grab my threaded thread with my needle. And I'm just going to come up. This part doesn't matter anywhere. I'm coming up right between the roll that I made and the last row between my loops, which is my finished work and the row. I'm coming up here and I'm catching a little bit of the edge and going back down. Now I'm gonna do this. I'll do one more like this. I, I like to do single, um, single strand. It's just a preference. It makes absolutely no difference to the end product, but I like single strand because I feel like when you have two threads you have you're, you're you're opening yourself up to twice the possibility of them getting tangled. So so why? And this one will last a little longer. So I'm coming around the corner. She's coming around the corner as she comes. And you can see some of my threads are popping up from the corner. That always happens. It always happens to me anyway. And it doesn't make any difference. I'm fiddling with it a little bit. And you still have these games of Watch this, I'm gonna pull this through. You still have these games as of roll as you go on the corners because they're the toughest part. Now, I left my thread under there that time. You can do that if you want to. And then I will come up here instead of working just on the top because corners are tougher. I'm gonna come under here. See, it's tangling up even with one strand. And you see how it's wrapping around the edge there? I'm gonna do that just on the corner because I can see that this corner has bad intentions and it's going to play me if it can, if I let it. So I'm gonna not let it. And I'm just gonna come up like this in a whip stitch, meaning I encompass the whole edge and see how I can fool with that little thread as I go, fooling with this little guy to try to get him to lay straight. And that is, I'll do one more. I was gonna say that's pretty damn good. It's close enough. Because all we're doing is holding this little pie crust in place. Try to get it over a little bit more. And if it seems like it's uh, got the lumpy bumpies, we're going to deal with that on the next stage, which is the actual whip stitching. So that corner actually looks, to me, perfect. Now I'm holding the roll as I go, just to be extra careful. And I'm going to continue... I'm gonna come back up so I can continue doing the faster stitch, more like a running stitch or a hemming stitch, where I catch just the edge of it and I come up on um, the side of the loops and then I tuck a little bit. And you're, you're not going to, because I will not let you, agonize and obsess about how thick your little pie crust is as you go around the edge here. Do not obsess. Do not pull out running stitches. Don't do anything silly like that because all you're doing is a it's a very, very loose, unfussy, not even very important running basting stitch. And all you want to do is hold up your hem, which in this case is this little roll, so that you can whip stitch it. And when you whip stitch it, you have all the power. And that thick whip stitching wool that I'm going to use and that you're going to use um, is so powerful it will override any little problems that you're having, any lumpy bumpies, any imperfections, any sort of uh, differences or vagaries going on here with width and bumps. None of that matters at all. Just get it as close as you can to even, and pretty close is good, sort of close is good, very close is good. Just get it um, tied up there and sticking with my one strand and don't agonize do not make this a night project if you are watching more than one little half hour comedy while you're doing this and you have spent too long fooling with this part because this should be a quick part and I am going to put you on pause for a second and I'm going to come back when I have come all the way around and I'm ready for the next stitch I will just be sitting here continuing doing this for the next three sides 
So I am coming right around this last corner here. This probably took, actually, I'm not going to tell you. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter how long it takes, as long as you're not frustrated with what you're doing or how long it's taking you. It shouldn't take too long is all I'm going to say. And it shouldn't be perfect. And as you can see, quite well, I'm sure, I'm going to tie it off like you would tie anything off with sewing. As you can see, it's not perfect. It is far from perfect. I'm going to do a little double knot. I'm going to do one more because um, it didn't quite get there. There we go. And the knot will be covered. The strings will be covered. Everything will be covered. I'm putting away my um, sewing needle, my little chenille needle, putting that back because I will need a larger needle now. So far from perfect, um, which means that everything is exactly as it should be. Now, the next thing I'm going to do is choose a border. And the thing with choosing a border is there's a lot of ways to do it. As you can imagine, people do it differently. Each person has different preferences. You already know that my intention is to whip stitch colors around the border. So in other words, to completely hide all of this white with thick yarn, like bulky type yarn, uh, specifically the, for this purpose that I've dyed. I've dyed all this stuff over here and a ton more. And now my object is to figure out what color do I wanna use? So here I am, I'll put this over here with this. Now, rug hookers will do one of many things if they are whipping a border. This is a different kind of a whip stitched border. We did not add cording. This is cording. We did this in the video with the, the four finishes, that long video with the four finishes. I showed you how to put cording into this and then wrap it. We didn't put cording in this time. We just did the little crust, the little pizza crust around the edges. And now we're going to whip it. So because there's not a thick cording in it, it's going to be less thick around the edges. We're not adding to this thickness. We're just adding to a fold of the monk's cloth, which is my foundation. So now this is where rug hookers get lots of choices. I have lots of colors that I like to use um, that I'm thinking about. And I was initially thinking about something like this. Now remember, I only had the 12 colors to play with when I did this. So I've already um, thought about color a lot with this project. I'm thinking about these colors a lot because they're really pulling out the little bird here, right? The little topiary bird, um, which to me is one of my favorite parts of this piece. Um, I don't know if you can see, you probably can. This one, um, I dyed with like multi. It's got multi colors of green. It's, so it makes it a little bit lighter. There's lights and darks in there. And this one is more of a solid green. It's still very pretty and it catches the light real pretty, but um, very different. Now, I think I'm going to go with a green. Um, I've got some nice pinks too that you can see over here. Now, if I were to choose one of these pinks, this is a bit thicker, but I also have it thin. If I went with this kind of pink, I would be, it would be a choice. It would be my choice on my project, your choice on yours, but it's always your choice. Um, I would be very worried if I went around the whole edge in this pink color, I would be very worried that it would become top heavy. And by that, I mean, I've got two shades of pink up in the top. I've got my light and my dark. Those are two darks, but you have to trust me. I have my light, yeah, I have my light and my dark. They're close, but they're up here and they're visibly different. You can see the way the valance falls. It's almost like pleated with a shadow. It's a lot of valance up there. That's a big piece of pink in this comp uh, composition. So if I were to add more pink all the way around, I would be worried that it would be top heavy because there'd be so much pink at the top with no break. So for that reason, I'm going to eliminate the pink. It is a design choice. And maybe you would want it that way. I want it a little bit more balanced because I want to celebrate all of the colors we've got here. I've also got wacky colors like this, you know, that are a mix of neon yellowy green, a little bit of gray blue, a little bit of just straight off white and gray. Um, that wouldn't be bad either. I mean, that's also, it really picks up this spotty material that's in the back. I could see that happening too. With this one, it's got a lot more colors and it's going to make the, the border busier, but also give it interest. So it's a tough call. I, I'm not going to completely eliminate that one. Um, I've got others. This one is another one, a blue that has multi colors in it. 
I don't think that's close enough to anything I have here to really tempt me. I've got this one that's blues and greens and some sort of cornflower blues that are a little bit darker. Um, that's quite tempting. That's quite tempting. You know what my other choice is, having said this, Let's come back to that thought. I'm going to tell you what my other choice is. But I'm also looking at these back here that I haven't had a chance to wind yet. So I've got a real bright yellow that's probably too bright. Now, you know, if you're somebody who loves bright and who loves contrast, if you think of artists like Kay Facet, so much color. You know, there's so many artists who love the look of when a color, for example, yellow, doesn't match. So we've got two yellows here that don't technically match. And to some people's eye, they match, right? It's, it's not a contrary thing. It's, it's not magic. It's just to you and, and to me too. I love it when colors are close to matching, but not quite matching. I don't do it with the clothing on my body, but I do do it with my rug hooking. There's this one too. This is like a, a lime green that's like this guy here, the topiary, but it's not as close as these. It's very close to this though. It would be a possibility to do the rug with more than one color, the binding and do something like that. And then there's like, oh, this lilac one's real good. That's quite good too. Oh, that's quite good. You know what that does is really pick up again on the spotted background. That's what's so neat about having a background like this. It turns into confetti. I remember I read this book once called The Magic Ship and I think it was set in Maine. And there was an opening scene where the ship was leaving the dock and people were, this is set in like the uh, late Victorian uh, period and people were shooting off like um, champagne bottle, corks flying everywhere. And uh, they described the, the, the shoulder of the captain's uniform being very dark and covered with confetti. And it was such an image of there being so much activity in life and then there being this sort of static confetti on this dark uniform shoulder. It was a, it was a happy image, it wasn't depressing, but whenever I see this kind of uh, busyness sitting there, it makes me think of that image of the captain. And adding something like this, I think, would really pick up um, the colors in the background. So that's a strong contender, too. And then I've got, like, some nice rose pinks. Remember Dusty Rose from the 1980s? Nobody does anything with Dusty Rose anymore. I've got some Dusty Rose. And I've also got this rose um, that I already wound that is more than one color of rose. It's not quite as boring as it looks. So coming back to that point, what a lot of rug hookers like to do is different colors. So for example, green, green, blue, pink, yellow, purple, change it up. Just do completely different colors all the way around. Colors that are in it, colors that are not in it, colors that speak to the person who's doing the piece. Another thing that rug hookers do a lot is finish the binding with matching colors to what is immediately next to it. In other words, I if I had dyed wool this color yellow, I would do this whole corner in that color yellow and stop. And I would do this whole color in that corner yellow and stop. And then I would do a little blip of orange. And then I would go to my dark, 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 rosy red colors. And down here, obviously it would be this antique black all the way down. So in other words, the border becomes, the binding becomes an extension of the composition and it's in exactly the same colors. It's a little bit more labor intensive only because it requires planning and it requires you dyeing matching yarn and wool, which many people do. Um, it depends on what parts of this process you enjoy. If you don't enjoy the dyeing part, maybe not this then, maybe not that choice. But what I can do is a real Harlequin thing and I could do each of the four edges maybe a different color. I might not do that just because this particular composition already has a lot of breaks. Red, black, yellow, yellow. So I'm not sure that I want to add the four corners. I'm talking out loud here, but these are all the kinds of choices that you need to think about and you need to make. Now let's just say for fun that I were going to do something like that. Let's, get, let's say I was going to use on the two these two corners, my two greens, and I was gonna do half and half with the really busy green and the lighter green, because those would blend so much that you might not notice that I had added um, a second green. Then I would, Teddy, I'm doing a video, honey. 
Then I would think about, come on, baby, you want a photo bomb for a sec? Mm -hmm. He's going to give a quick photo bomb. There's my man, Mr. Silly, he's coming in the room. You want to say hi to everybody? Hi. <laughs> Don't forget uh, to, to subscribe, to like, to comment. Uh -huh. Don't talk about video games. Don't talk and... about... Don't talk about, nope, don't talk about video games. We're talking about real Watch cooking. our channel. The Bubble Fart channel. We'll talk about that later. Honey, I love you. I'm doing something. Okay. Um, okay, so I could use the two greens on the sides. Lose my train of thought. And you know what else I could do? I could add, what if I added, okay, what if I went with these four colors all the way around and I switched them out as I went? They match real well to the composition. And what I like about using these colors and not any of the other brights or other tones that are also in this, what I like about it is if I use these colors, it's really going to pop the part of the composition that I like the best, which is the green topiary, right? The little green bird topiary. So using those colors is going to pop that the most. It's in the center. I want people's eye to, to find the center pretty quickly. And also in the center is the second bird on the vase, and he's in blue. And there's a lot of blue in here. So that could really, this combination could really pull the eye in. You can see that this blue also really matches this kind of squiggly purple I did. And then around here, I did the lighter purple with the lime green that's dangerously close to this. It might even be the same color. I think I'm going to do that. Let's do that. Let's do, let's go for that. I could use one of these four colors since I happen to be choosing four on each side. That's a lot of fun. That will add to your composition, right? It won't just be complimenting it, hanging out in the background. It will become part of the look of your piece if you do something that's that much of a statement with your binding. So make sure that that's the choice that you're making on purpose and that's what you like. You can always pull it out if you don't like it, but let's just see how this goes. I'm going to get started and I'm going to start with random. Let's start with a colorful one actually. And I'm going to start in the bottom left as I normally do. So I am now using a tapestry needle and it's dull on the bottom and it has a giant eye, right? The, the camel passes through it eye because this is really, really bulky yarn. Bulky yarn is great for edges because you'll see how well it sits. So I'm going to put a little bit in there. You know what? I'm going to measure how much I've got. That's what this stupid measuring board is for after all, right? 36. Let's do that. So I know I'm starting with one yard. And then I can really control if I'm measuring as I go. I can really, you could do sort of intermittent changes, like um, almost like a barcode, right? Like when you're purchasing something, like a little bit of green, bzz, even less of the other green, bzz, unexpected, um, not measured changes, not equal changes. Um, or you can do exactly the same amount of each one. Green, mixed green, blue, mixed blue, green. Um, it depends on what you like. So I am threaded, no knot. I'm coming into the bottom left area. I'm just gonna hold the tail over to the side. And I'm going to come up right above my line of stitches between the finished row of loops and my little pizza crust. I'm going to come up and the games have already begun. Quick as that. Simple as that. I want to make sure you can see me okay. So, oh, did I already do something stupid? Already did something stupid. I'm going to start by going down. I want to, I want to hook that little guy. So now I'm going to come up right above the tail. I'm, I'm just hiding the tail. That's all. Oh, I went inside the hoop. That's all I got going right now is I'm hiding the tail. So I've got my first guy in place, and now I'm coming right next to it. This is something you have to figure out, and you got to feel it out. It's going to take you two seconds to get a feel for this. You're going to sort of, for the early ones, before your hand is like a robot that just flies, um, I'm going to sort of measuring out, make sure that they're touching each other, that they're close by, that they're not too far apart. You want to keep it real even. You don't want any white showing, in other words. I am just looping around, hiding my tail, covering my pizza crust. I'm hitting some knots in there from the thread. Now, the reason my needle does not have to be sharp at this point is I'm only going through one layer of 
backing. Before I was going through one layer plus, one layer plus catching, snagging the other part that I, <laughs> I went through the thing again, holding it the wrong way around. That's my problem. Um, but yeah, you don't need a super sharp needle at this point. Did I do it again? I did it again. See what I did? I got it under the loop. When I put the camera off, I'm going to be doing it right side up for me and it's going to be easier. Okay. I didn't realize the camera turned off, but I just made it to this first little corner and the corners are always tricky. And you know this, if you do, um, like crocheting or other, other crafts that have corners, you need a little more covering and fabric on corners, right? Cause there's just more surface in a small space. It's not just business as usual. So I really have to be sure on the corners that my base is covered, right? The white material, my foundation is covered. And I'm really being extra sure that my stitches are coming up right next to each other and just where I want them to. Now I can see I have trouble. This one is not quite tight enough and I'm able to pull at it, right? This is a work in progress. I'm able to pull and fiddle and fool until it looks better to me. It looks better to me. So that's good. But I can see under here too, there's a little bit of white showing. So I'm going to try to just move these with my finger a little bit over. It's just fiddly. This is not going to defeat you. It's just fiddly and particularly on the corners. So I'm also coming to the end of this color. So I'm going to be hiding that shortly. This is coming around here. Yep. And I can see the corner is settling down. Now remember that no matter what's going on with the corner, it might seem like it's bulky. It might seem like it's not bulky enough. Just remember, you are going to have the final say regarding that corner because you are going to press it at the end. And when you press it at the end, it's like blocking your piece. It really, really, it, that's the magic when you, when you do that because it really takes out all of the lumpy bumpies, imperfections. You can, you can really manipulate things in your favor. So I've got that there. Maybe should have gone one less. What I'm going to do, I'm going to force this here and I want my tail to come up. I left the tail a little bit short, but I'm not going to let it ruin my night. I'll just pull this through and then pull it through here. Okay. Do I want? Yep. Yeah. So now I've got the tail here and I'm going to hold it in my hand and wrap the next color to hide the tail. Hey, if the tail doesn't get hidden or if the tail decides to be belligerent and stick its head out at some point at the end of the process, you would just take the needle in like this. I'll do it right now. Let me see if I can do this and hide it. That one came out a little bit short. Good thing it's the back. So let me see if I can squeeze this through here. I'm just going to try to get this. See, I've got this ready to, and it's hidden in there forever. So that takes care of that tail that was given some trouble. Now, one yard of that binding did this. This is the corner. So it, I'm not going to measure it yet because it's hard to tell. A corner is always going to be different than uh, just, just straight going business as usual, straight stretches. So let's now, let's move to one of our other colors. I'm going to pull out another yard. So I know how much we're using as we go on. I've got another 36 inches right here. And I'm going to show you how to add another color and then I'm going to work for a while because you know what I'll be doing while you're not with me is I'm just going to be going around the edges and doing exactly the same as what we've done so far. So I've got this tucked in again here. You know what? I'm going to tuck it on the back this time. I liked pulling his tail through like that. That worked great. I'm going to see if I can hide it and if I can't, I'll deal with it up front. So I'm holding my thing back here this time and I'm going to attempt to hide it. I'll show you as I go. Same thing. I'm coming up in the next hole and you're going to see new colors being introduced right here. Can't really tell the difference yet. And see on the back, I'm holding this with my thumb and I'm hiding the tail as I go. So Make sure those are hanging out on the sides there, right next to each other. And I'm going to keep doing this. And I just want to remind you that if you have the lumpy bumpies, 
in your little roll and your little crust along the edges if it seems like a particularly lumpy bumpy part like you got a big bulbous bump that you're encountering pull a little bit harder here it's like a tummy tuck right boom it pulls it right back in because i can see my border right here is a little bit fatter than for example here so i'm holding my tail behind i'm hooking that in as i go and i'm just going to pull a hair tighter there than i have thus far because i want it to be as even as it can be knowing in the back of my mind that when i block it all will be well i want to give my my binding the best chance of being as close to perfect as it can now i don't want it to be completely perfect because this is rug hooking and there's no place in my mind for perfection with this kind of rug hooking the primitive type rug hooking i want it to look um, slightly imperfect in a quirky artful and uh, still capable way you know not like i've been booming 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 it up i shouldn't say booming it up that's one of my favorites so here we go into the darker blue the cornflower color and i can already see that it's picking up the blue that's right here i think i have effectively hidden my tail by now Oh, there's just a little bit of the tail showing. Do you see that? So I'll deal with that later. That's a little tiny bit. But you can see that I have moved from green to the darker blue. And the darker blue seems to be a hair thicker. So that is unexpected. I think it is a hair thicker. I did not realize that. So what I'm going to end up doing is something that happens when you make a mistake. I'm going to pull all these out. I'm going to try from the back. And that'll give me a chance to... I'm going to leave this in the video too. I'm not going to edit this out because this kind of thing happens. This blue and green is a slightly... It's a hair thicker, like one strand thicker than the green that I used prior. And that means that the border is a little bit fatter than the border right before it. This might not matter to you, and it typically wouldn't matter to me, but I really want this to be perfect to show you in a video. So I'm gonna put you on pause for a second while I pull out to here. And that taught me the lesson, and hopefully you the lesson, to pay attention as you're going, because there is a change right here when I had the color change. I will be right back when I sort out this mess. So now that I have been correcting this, I've been pushing I've been with this little discrepancy in the width of the sorry the weight of the yarn I'm just pulling it like tummy tuck pulling it Spanx pulling it here right around just a little bit more than I would the first one and I've done it all the way on this blue so far and I'm going to show you laying flat it's definitely working and it even wants to stay that way I had to pull a bit harder but it's given me a really even um, width this is a hair thicker than this. So that got me. But in the end, it did not defeat me. It just got me for a second until I figured out what to do. Now, with this kind of thing, I don't want to encourage anybody ever uh, into thinking, okay, so I can use any weight of yarn to finish my binding. And I like this sock yarn and I like this worsted yarn. It won't work like that. The reason that this is going to be okay is because these are super similar in weight. And thus I'll be able to block it, iron it, press it, make it perfect in the end. But if I were using two wildly different widths, it would not be okay. There's no amount of, of tummy tuck uh, stitching you can run to make that work out. So it is working out well. And you might notice that it wants to do a little bit of this, particularly because I'm pulling hard. It will do that regardless, but because I'm pulling hard on this little stretch, it wants to do it even more. So I want you to know 1000% as I know 1000%, otherwise I wouldn't keep going, that when I hit this with the iron, that is going to go away. I've done much larger rugs with whipped borders that always want to ripple and wave because there's so much material in a small space. This border is loaded with wool, loaded. And the wool is moving directionally in like a spiral, in a curl. So it does become a little bit wavy and it can um, freak you out. And you just need to remind yourself that once you start pressing it, pressing the border, 
that that is going to work itself out. It's not going to be an issue anymore. So don't worry about that. I can see it wants to move. Wait till you see it when it's done. It's going to be perfect. So I'm going to keep going. I got to the end of my yard here with this color and I'm going to switch to my next color and I'm just going to keep doing what I'm doing. Thread my big needle going around and around and around, taking care on the corners to make sure that they are completely covered and that I haven't got any little bald spots, little holidays in there. And I'm going to next switch to one of my other colors. So you're going to see the four colors come up in this. And then I will come back to you as soon as I've gotten to a better place where I'm almost at the end. And then we can look at the end and press it together. Okay. Now it is quite good if you can when you're changing colors. Now I'm changing colors again. I've gone from the green to the blue to the lighter one. And now I'm changing to the solid green. And it does help if you're able to um, just get over the fiddliness of it in your mind. This is my tail end up here that I'm going to hide like this while I stitch around. If you can keep the other one under here, so you've got one underneath with your thumb and this one here, I'm kind of pinching both at the same time. It does help so that you don't have two tails to hide next to each other. It is certainly possible and you can do it, but when you are changing colors like this, it is a little bit easier to keep one on top and one on the bottom so that you can um, pinch both at the same time and then you only have one tiny invisible lump on each side. If you keep everything on the same side you might have a slightly less invisible lump or you'd have to pull much harder to hide the little lump because it would be it would be two tails wide if you see what I mean. So that's working real well to pinch them both at the same time and hide and you know what like I said before and like I showed before if one of them rears its ugly head at some point you can just pull it through into the cord that you've made or you can just leave it hanging out on the back where nobody can see it there's lots of possibilities when you have little rogue ends like that sticking up so I'm gonna keep going like this I'm approaching the corner and I will come back to you when the next exciting thing happens now I'm going to show you one more little piece of silliness here uh, that's a silly variation. If you have noticed up to this point I've been going up from the bottom with my needle, right? Bottom to top. So hang in there. So now look at me all crazy daisies going top to bottom. So the point I'm making is it just does not matter. If you find that you are sitting there whip, whipping your rug and you start wondering to yourself, Jiminy Cricket, I was supposed to be going top to bottom all this time and I've been going bottom to top or vice versa. And you start, you know, uh, second guessing yourself and Googling on Google, are you supposed to whip stitch top to bottom or bottom to top? Probably the first thing is you might be stalling. And the second thing is it just doesn't matter. If it feels better for you to come up with the needle, you should be coming up with the needle. If it feels better for you to go down with the needle, then that's what you should be doing. But whatever you're doing, I bet that the yarn is wrapping itself around the edge of your little pizza crust and it's covering it up. So regardless of the way that you're doing it, it does not make any difference. And it does not make any difference to the way that the final product will look, right? The final product is gonna look like a whip stitched border on a hook truck. So, don't be too hard on yourself and don't be looking for problems where there are no problems. All straightforward. Make sure that you're doing it in a way that's the most intuitive for you. Now I am coming up to my third corner and I can truly say that both of my last corners are what I would call a pig's breakfast. I really made a mess of it. I clipped a little bit too close to the corner of the finished piece and then I struggled with rolling it and stitching it and I made a big mess. And I did not do that for teaching purposes. I did that because I'm me and I'm being myself and um, I'm often a ding dong, so that happens. But I am gonna use it to show you that if you do the same kind of thing and any part of your border looks like a pig, pig's breakfast, it would be hard to make it look any worse than that that it is truly not going to matter um, to the finished product. You are going to hide that with your binding. So let's see, I'm changing out colors here. Let's go with the 
plain green. I'm gonna have to add a little bit of extra wrapping on those corners because I made that mistake. So knowing that, let's go in with shaky hands, just kidding. It's going to be fine. I'm coming back up here and I got one tail in the front, one tail in the back. I'm gonna pinch them both down. You can use the extra bulk right here, so that is okay. I'm gonna start my corner pushing over. It is a little bit trickier to start a new color on a corner, but now we, this is the third corner already, so we are definitely into our stride here. It can be done. I'm just pushing the yarn over to the side to hide it, and I'm doing the same with my finger on the back. And I'm pulling a little bit more loosely. I'm not doing the Spanx type tummy tuck pull as I did with my thicker pieces because I don't want it to pull tight on the corners. I want it to go a little bit looser because it's a little bit skimpy on the, on the corner because I made a mistake and I cut too close to the corner. Again, I did it again. If you watched my last video, you must be thinking, you, you did that in your last video. Multiple times, I did, and now I've done it again. So, I gotta be me. Can't even blame the kids, they've left me alone all this time. So I'm coming around here. Now what you sometimes have to do when you are on a corner and you've got a skimpy issue here, you sometimes have to backtrack over past stitches. Like, I'm coming back up here into the same hole I've already done. You probably can't see how tight that is, but I'm gonna go through here again into the same place and cover one of the past stitches I did here. It's just a cat and mouse thing. You try to come up in the right spot and defeat the little gap or the little um, the little ebb because it's a little skimpy. I want it a little bit beefier. I want more of a flow than an ebb. So I'm just playing with these corner pieces. If you make a lot of mistakes, if you go suddenly, oh, now it's too thick. What have I done now? Then you're just gonna take your pieces out. You're just gonna take the needle off and you're just gonna take your pieces out and, and have, have a go number two at it. Um, it's not gonna be perfect the first time. It might not be perfect in your mind ever, but I bet you it will be pretty close to perfect when, when you're satisfied enough that you leave it alone and put the needle down. Uh, you know, just very few things in life obviously are perfect. I, I, don't, I don't know any perfect people, for example, um, and this isn't gonna be perfect either. I'm not perfect. Maybe you're perfect, maybe you're the one. I hope you are. This life is tricky when you're boobing it up. So there we go. I got my corner in and really, that is as good a corner as any. There is no, there's no issue with this corner. It's completely covered. Um, it's gonna lay perfectly fat when I, flat when I steam it. There's no issue at all. So we went from pig's breakfast to whipped corner that's nice and fluffy and, and fat looking. Um, I'm not talking about the, the stomach view you're getting in the video. I'm talking about the width of the corner and the thread looking really healthy and uniform, even with what's come before and hopefully what is gonna come after it. So I'm on my solid green here. I'm gonna continue stitching around the corner to the end, and then we're gonna look at what we've got. So here we are coming to the end, and we're gonna talk about a couple of things and then do our final, our final bits to see the end of this piece. Last, second to last stitch here, look at this. So this really hasn't taken that much time. Again, I don't wanna to talk too much about time because I don't wanna have you comparing the amount of time it takes you doing this for the first time with the amount of time it would take somebody who's done this before because that's not fair. Um, this, looks, this looks pretty done to me. So what I'm gonna to do to finish the back to get rid of my last um, piece is I'm gonna cut it. Get my needle on this side. I'm gonna cut it and I'm gonna do what I did before and send it through the channel. pushing down in here and bringing it through here. I don't want it to pull too far on this side, so I'm gonna hold it a little bit. And there we go. We'll deal with that later and press that later. So, see, it did move a little bit. It moved a little bit, so let me just move it back. 
I want it to be perfect, 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 because this is a color change thing. Now, I'm sure that you have noticed my having um, changed color between four colors, switching it out that way, because I know it's hidden under there, I'm going to cut this, and now it's gone forever. My having changed color four times between four different colors definitely gives you more work. I love the way that this came out. I love it. I absolutely love the color changing. I haven't blocked it yet. That's next. But I love the way it changes colors. That ba Those four backgrounds make me think about my vacations to Ireland and stuff like that. I just love um, the border. I love it. Um, and it looks great on the back too, right? Nothing too horrible going on, except I got some mungs cloth stuck there. Uh, nothing too horrible going on except the lumpy bumpies. And one other thing that is driving me crazy, and I know I might correct it a little bit with my steaming and finishing, but what's driving me really crazy is this. It might not be glaring to you, or maybe it's super glaring to you, but it's this is where one of my yarns ends, the one I was pulling real hard, the tummy tuck yarn. And I just feel like, I don't know if it's the transition from the blue to the next um, piece of green, but it just feels like it goes in too far just right here. So what I'm gonna do is fix that by coming back in right where it's happening. So in other words, I feel like that one part is a little skimpy. I'm holding my piece on the back again, my tail, and I'm just gonna wind around that part where that change happens. And I'm not even happy with that. I'm not even happy with that. Let me get this out. It's too far over. It's real particular what I'm looking at, and I hope you can see it too. It's real particular. It's this right where the blue starts, so I don't wanna do anything extra. I just want to give it a little more body right in that one little spot where I feel like it's a bit skimpy. And then we're going to talk about another important aspect. So let me just get this corrected. And this is how you correct things that you feel are a miniature pig's breakfast. Keep them nice and steady and... One more should do it. That is gonna do it in my mind. And I have this too small to run under, so I'm just gonna pull it through this way for now while we finish off our stuff. I've got my iron going, and I'm gonna do my blocking next. This is what happens when you cut it too short. We got this. There we go. I'm pull it through for now. So that seems better to me. That seems healthier. So another thing that I want to mention before I forget is amounts, right? So we used four different colors. And remember, I was dividing them into yards. So as it happens, this is one yard. This is one yard. I can see clearly where the changes happened. The corner was different, uh, a little bit, a little bit more. I would say twice as much at the corner. So let's say that this is a yard. I'm going to count the yards that I've used thus far. This is where I, this is where I repaired. So let's count that as like, let's say a half yard to be on the cautious side. So we've got about one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen yards of fabric on this piece, which is exactly, well, 30 to, so it's about just, it's just under 12 by 12, just a hair under 13 yards. So it's quite a bit that you need. If you are buying, you know, um, yarn to finish the edge of something, just know, um, I'll do the math and I'll put it into a comment or something or put it into the post. But I am using for, for a border that every side is about, uh, 11 to 12 well let's say uh, 11 inches just over 11 inches each one of those sides is taking one two three four five yards to be on the safe side to be on the safe side definitely not much more than that don't buy 10 extra yards you know even five extra yards is a little overkill it's it's something of a science um, you get you know if, if you're if you're covering your backing and there's no white showing 
and that's you're leaving it at that you're not making it big and puffy you're not doing something fancy or if you're doing what I did it's going to be that amount give or take a hair so now I've got just a wet cloth on a wet face cloth on and I'm going around the edges and I'm pressing it. and I'm pressing it like I'm blocking it and I'm probably going to do this for a while until I'm dripping with sweat and this is going to help it all lay down because at the end of the day that wool is still wool just like your rug hooking wool whether you did your piece with yarn or wool strips or what um, it is wool and it does need to be blocked it needs to be shown who the boss is and you do that with an iron on high steam and a slightly damp press cloth and if you sit here for long enough I know when I blocked a rug that was like a the size of a bath mat something like 20 something by maybe 16 um, I blocked it for about two hours um, you know I just wanted to be sure that everything uh, that's the whole thing that's not just the border just wanted to be sure the whole thing was laying flat and speaking of laying flat remember how I had my issues with the corners and also that one color being a little bit thicker than all the others I'm gonna I'm gonna show you that the proof is in the pudding immediately because already this is the blue here it's already lying down perfectly so it's not it's not going to give us any trouble at all I do like the color change in this border having a color changing yarn and having several is, is quite quite fun that adds a lot I think a lot of interest this piece reminded me of like a Matisse you know the shapiness of it and um, also swatch watches if you remember swatch watches I, I called it on my Instagram something between a Matisse and a swatch watch because the colors struck me as real sort of 80s colors yeah this is pressing just fine the border that was even already I mean I've done this for one minute but even just doing this for just a couple of minutes is making the border lay right down I mean there's no there's not going to be any issue with the border wanting to bob up so I will say in conclusion because this is going to take a little while and it's probably not going to look that different to you on film it's 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 already laying quite flat I will say to you in conclusion with this finish I'll remind you let me unplug this I'll remind you what we did with this finish was we folded over the edges and whip stitched so the difference between this and some of the other finishes I've done before, a similar finish I've done before, I've used this cord. When you use this cord, the plus, the pro, is that wrapping it around, particularly on the corners, you get a lot of body and that body is uniform. That's the plus. The minus with you that using the cord is you get a lot more bulk. Of course, you can get different gauges or thicknesses of cord but you get added bulk to the border under the whip stitching. And the whip stitching already adds quite a bit of body. You get more with the cord. So that's the minus the con of the cord, but the plus is that you get that uniform uh, base to start whipping around. The pro of doing the same finish with no cord, like I just did on this piece, is that the edge isn't standing up quite as high it's down lower because there's no cord in there of any gauge or thickness. Um, so I'm getting, I'm getting an edge that is pretty um, even or level with the piece itself. So if you were doing something on the floor, for example, um, tripping came up in one of the comments. Is it good to do a whip stitched border, even though they're the strongest for a rug that you're going to use as a rug? Is it good to do that? What is the trip factor when you have a rounded higher edge on your rug well it's higher the trip factor is higher of course um, and thus sometimes the comedy factor is higher no, I shouldn't say that but the um, main thing is that it is it is better preserved your edges whether they're protected by binding tape which was another thing I talked about in the longer video or the whip stitching it's a bit safer but you can use smaller gauge smaller thickness cord or you can try this and on a, on a rug this is a great option it's another pro of doing this particular thing just folding up your edges basting them down and whipping around them 
is that you don't need any more supplies than your um, huge eyed embroidery needle, it only a uh, tapestry needle, it only has to be big enough to put your thread through. So that's it. It just, if your thread is thinner than this, then it wouldn't even need to be this big. If you're um, going with something more like this, I'm sorry, your yarn, then you might need something that actually would still fit through this. But this needle only has to be as thick as what you're putting through it. So there isn't a rule about the needle. It's just make sure that it works with the equipment you're using. And with this finish, the only equipment you're using is the yarn to whip and the needle. There is nothing in, in a needle and thread, standard sewing needle and thread to baste it. So that's another pro is if you're sitting there and you're thinking, oh, I'm not near any rug hooking stores or craft stores, hobby stores. I'd really like, I've got good momentum. I'd really like to keep going with this. I don't have any cord. Fold up your edges, baste them, and whip around them. See how it goes. I showed you a couple of times how to make corrections if they're coming out too thin or not quite right. Um, if you make pig's breakfasts here and there, I did on, on three of the four quarters in the end, but um, all of them came out fine. I would dare say good. So I'm real happy with this. I'm happy with the way it looks. This pattern is coming out in our group, and our group is called, on Facebook, Rug Hooking and symbol punch needle club and this is coming out on there first i try to put everything out there on first because all my buddies are on there and we are such a um, busy active and close group but this will be coming out as a kit and it's coming out as a um, hook by number kit i'm going to do a series of hook by number kits i i know that um years ago claire murray used to do rugs where each part would show the number on the backing that you were supposed to use and of course your wool corresponded to that uh, so did I think it was, what was she called Miss Miss Lydia or something an earlier sort of mid-century um, pattern maker always burlap did the same thing by adding a sort of paint by number number in every spot so I will be doing a series of those that I'm going to be calling hook by number and brilliant right and, um, uh, it'll be easy for beginners to follow uh, which colors are in which places because the numbers will be on the canvas and the yarn will be numbered. So that will be there. I'm just debating whether I should also add binding yarn. So in this kit, um, anybody who gets the kit could also practice binding. That's something I'll think about. You can give me your comments on that if you want. But in any case, please do like if you watch my videos, please like, comment, subscribe. It matters a lot to me. It lets me know what my numbers are. It lets YouTube know what my numbers are. And it helps other people find me who are looking for rug hooking videos and beginning rug hooking videos, uh, punch needle videos, latch hook videos, all kinds of videos. So um, you doing that helps me a lot because I am obviously a stay-at-home mom and I'm trying to make this into a business. And it's good for people to be able to find me who are who are looking for this. So that would be super great. And I will be back soon with another video, hopefully on something that you're interested in. And in the meantime, have fun with your hooking and your punching and all your endeavors.